In the southeast of Asia, the territory of Malaysia extends both over the point of the Malay Peninsula and the island of Borneo. It occupies a privileged position between the Pacific and Indian Oceans and enjoys over 4,500 kilometers of coastline. The country has a constantly warm and humid equatorial climate. Malaysia is recognized as an area of biological megadiversity by reason of the richness of its flora and fauna. Only about 20 countries have this status. Malaysia owes much of its biodiversity to its tropical forest, which covers 70% of the country, but which is undergoing intensive exploitation. The country is trying to find a balance between the protection of the natural heritage and industrial activities. The country's population is also very varied. It's mainly composed of Malays, the ethnic group which has given its name to the country. But to that must be added a quarter of citizens of Chinese origin and many of mixed ethnicity. A human patchwork enriched by very many ethnic minorities, every one attached to its language and ancestral traditions. The Malaysian population is young. Almost a third of the inhabitants are under 15. They have a high quality education system where dress codes are respected. On their heads, the Malay boys wear the traditional songkok. The creativity of Malaysians can be seen in many fields. The most varied influences, both Western and Oriental, are found especially in their cuisine, where sugar is used in great quantity. Malaysia is an original constitutional monarchy. The king is elected for a five-year term. The parliamentary system is directly inspired by the English model. Indeed, the country was a British colony, but the Dutch and before them the Portuguese also left their mark. Malaysia has been independent since 1957. With its bold lines, the architecture has accompanied the development of the country. However, references to architectural models remain very evident. The components of Malaysian society blend in with the architectural heritage and the architects sometimes take the liberty of turning things upside down. Concrete buildings have replaced many traditional wooden structures. Colonial architecture finds it hard to resist the pressures of a population that has increased fivefold in 50 years. Islam is the official religion. Imported by Arab and Indian traders, it developed from the 15th century on. Buddhism is also very long established in Malaysia, but has been supplanted by Islam. Today, Malaysian Buddhists are of Chinese origin. Hinduism also took to the trade routes to implant itself in the country, even though it is still a minority religion. As for Christianity, it came here with the European colonists. Consumption has become a religion in its own right, in a country that is developing at a rapid rate, with its advantages and its drawbacks. The economy has long since progressed beyond the cottage industry stage. It's based on highly efficient industry and growing exports. 15% of the population make a living from farming, still using often rudimentary means. Malaysia has become the third richest country in Southeast Asia. Its dynamism is supported by its infrastructures which aim to guarantee efficiency and cultural sensitivities. Today the country falls into the category of medium income countries. It has set its sights on achieving developed country status in the medium term. Tourism is one of Malaysia's economic development axes. This sector has helped to bring traditional architecture up to date. Tourism also promotes the immediate proximity of nature. The omnipresent sea provides visitors with limitless resources. This is true also for the tropical forest, a jewel of wild nature. Asians are the biggest tourist group, but the borders are wide open.
Having emerged from the jungle, Kuala Lumpur is today the capital of the country. When you arrive there, it's difficult to imagine that the town didn't exist in the middle of the 19th century. Thanks to its terrific growth, the town has mushroomed. And yet, despite the expansion, the town has preserved its human dimension and a remarkable architectural heritage. Kuala Lumpur was lucky to have been chosen as the capital by the English. The British colonists endowed it with stunning buildings that blended Victorian and Moorish styles. The English used to play cricket on a field that has become Independent Square. Kuala Lumpur is a very green town and in some places is even rural. English influence is also very clear. In the lake garden, Her Majesty's gardeners have exploited the vast plant resources of the tropics. In general, the English let nature express herself in their gardens. Here, they had to exert a little discipline. Creation spills over from the gardens as far as the National Theatre. Designed by a Malaysian architect, the building blends into an environment entirely devoted to art. Between mineral and vegetable, there is a fine line. Nature and sculpture come together through their shapes and their materials. The royal palace rises in perfect symmetry. The building is a symbol of the stability of the monarchy. In fact, the king is always elected by and from among nine sultans. This system was designed to satisfy the nine candidates for the throne at the time of independence. Majid Negara is another symbol. It's the National Mosque. The building was designed by Le Corbusier. The famous architect applied his principles in agreement with the nation's Islam. Daoud Abdul Qadir. Uh, practicing a moderate uh, brand of Islam. For example, there are some countries where they enforce strict segregation between the male and females. Whilst in our case, in Malaysia, we do not adopt that practice. Male and female freely mix. There is no physical segregation. The Buddhist temple of Tian Hu is dedicated to the goddess of paradise. It was built in the 1980s. The Chinese are often trying to discover their destiny. This is to get the advice from the goddess. So we will lift up all the fortune stake together and we will release it after our prayer to the god. All right, when we release, the one that bounces up the highest will be the advice from her. Okay, I will release now. So I have one that's the highest. And the number is number 51. So I'll choose the number 51. And I'll take out the advice. And I'll read it again. Chance is always positive with the Chinese. The Petronas Towers were at one time the tallest in the world. They are each made up of five sections which refer to the five pillars of Islam. The building is the headquarters of the National Petroleum Company, but it represents so much more. Mohamed Sohelmi is an architect. It is a symbol that shows the capability of the nation, and Malaysia actually have the uh, technology to, uh, to build the tallest building in the world. So it is an icon to make the country proud, and I think up to date, uh, people are still proud of uh, KLCC. At the beginning, the town was set up at the confluence of two rivers. In the oldest quarter of Kuala Lumpur, they're trying to save the facades that are threatened by the climate and the developers. But is it not too late? Has modernity not disfigured the town as it sacrificed its soul? In a way, yes. Uh, but then I think you cannot stop that from happening because uh, 
like any other cities, Kuala Lumpur is changing and is uh, is going through the process of evolution. Built in the Art Deco style, the Central Market is a true vestige of the past. It contains dozens of boutiques and workshops where many craftsmen work. The Central Market opened its doors in 1936. All cultures can be found there. Among the innumerable stalls, two materials infallibly attract attention. Silver, often superbly wrought, and even more so, pewter, which has made the country's fortune. Malaysia has produced up to 60% of the world's pewter. In the Pudu quarter, another market is devoted to electronic equipment. All the products are imported directly from China. Malaysia is a great importer of electronic components. These are used in the manufacture of goods destined for export. Most commercial activities in Malaysia are controlled by the Chinese. Their skills in this field are long established. Their natural talents for trade were recognized by the Europeans as far back as the 16th century. The Indians, who are much fewer in number, have nevertheless managed to have their own successes. At the beginning, the English called upon the Chinese and the Indians to work in the mines or on the plantations. In fact, the Malay sultans granted lands to the English for farming. But they refused to have their subjects employed by foreigners. This explains the country's surprising ethnic diversity. Not all convictions are sacrificed on the altar of commerce. The precepts of their religion are respected by Malaysian Muslims. Even though it is a moderate form of Islam here, women wear the hijab, which leaves the face uncovered. Makeup is allowed as long as it isn't too showy. Malaysians have a taste for beauty, as their craft work shows. Batik is a special technique for painting on cloth and produces very sophisticated shades of color. It's a refined and ancient art. Tropical wood is an ideal material for artistic creation and there is no lack of sources of inspiration. Inspired by the features of the face, sculptor Zorala bin Silin has one speciality, the nose, or rather, noses. My nose generation is different from Western nose, different from Caribbean nose, different from Roman nose, and different from Arabic nose. The nose which I did here is to tell that a generation belongs to everybody in the world. The nose, a universal subject. Life never stops in a town where traditions are ever present. To the south of Kuala Lumpur, Putra Yaya has become the administrative capital of the country. Governmental services have moved to a new town almost entirely made up of office buildings.
Putrajaya is a rational town, run completely by computer. The highest government authorities have taken up residence there, like the prime minister in a splendid palace. With its pink granite cupola, the Putra Mosque can hold 15,000 worshippers. Quite clearly, town planners had grand ideas when they designed the capital of the future. Not far from Kuala Lumpur, one is also struck by the excessive size of the Batu Cave site. At the entrance stands an immense statue of the god Murugan, the war god of the Tamil Hindus. A monumental staircase rises up the rock face. The local residents are monkeys, which are sacred animals for the Hindus. In the limestone rock, a number of caves have been dug to serve as temples. Together, they make up the largest Hindu sanctuary outside of India. This is where the great popular gathering for the Taipusam festival is held. In the southwest of the Malay Peninsula lies Malacca. The town made a very early appearance in the history of the country. It attracted a great deal of interest at a time when Kuala Lumpur was still nothing more than a swamp. Classed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the town has taken on the colors of the different cultures that have marked it, beginning with Western culture. The first Europeans arrived in Malacca in the beginning of the 16th century. They were the Portuguese. The town marks one of the farthest points of Portuguese expansion in the Indian Ocean. The Portuguese stayed here for more than a century. The Dutch then took over in the service of the powerful Dutch East India Company. At the beginning of the 19th century, the Dutch handed Malacca over to the English in an exchange of Indonesian territories. The English left an indelible mark on the town. Bitter negotiations between the two maritime superpowers finally ended in agreement. Nazari Aumad is the town's director of culture. They trade spices from this archipelago. From the Malay archipelago, they trade black pepper, chili, and a paprika, uh, nutmeg, uh, cinnamon, and they also counter trade with China in terms of silk, gunpowder, porcelain, China ware. So the Chinese sailed to Malacca and stopped here. The, the Western people came here and uh, meet here in Malacca to, to do all the trading. The town opened up to the outside world through the Malacca Straits. Generations of travelers have called in here. In Yonker Street, globetrotters used to meet up here during the hippie years. The street is right at the heart of the Chinese quarter, but the inscriptions are universal. Many artists and craftsmen have premises here. The days of hippie flower power are long gone, and yet an unchanged, relaxed atmosphere still pervades in the area. Artifacts are still made according to traditional methods, like the parang, the Malaysian machete. This parang is for working in the fields. Some traditions originated in China. And this is the bound fit shoes. Eh? So women from three years old, they have to start binding her feet. So they bind the feet, the smaller the feet, the more beautiful. Because women, when they bind the feet, they can easily marry to the rich men. The fashion for bound feet lasted in China for over a thousand years. These days, it's forbidden, but only since the beginning of the 20th century. In the evening, the night market brings a fairground atmosphere to Yonkers Street.
It's karaoke time. Malaysia was formerly the world leader in natural rubber production. Still today, Southeast Asia is the world's main producer. Synthetic rubber has failed to dethrone Hevea sap. Thanks to its remarkable properties, it is a vital component of tyre manufacturing. Palm oil spearheads the country's economy. Malaysia is currently the world's second largest producer of palm oil. At the southern tip of the peninsula, Johor Bahru, formerly Johor under British rule, is Malaysia's second city. The city's economic activity is strongly stimulated by its close proximity to Singapore on the opposite side of the Strait of Johor. Two bridges link the island state to the continent. In the centre of Johor Bahru, British colonial influence is still quite plain to see, even in the heart of the Chinese quarter. It is a cultural melting pot, juxtaposing church towers with mosque minarets. Johor is also the name of a state under the jurisdiction of a sultan. Malaysia is in fact a federation made up of 13 such states. The city benefits greatly from the prosperity of Singapore, one of the world's richest countries. Doors open for Singaporeans and their significant purchasing power. A multitude of duty-free shopping centers entices them across the border. Commerce has been second nature here for centuries. Across shop counters, any differences in race, language, religion and nationality disappear as if by magic. And at night, a mirage seems to appear by the riverside. Having followed the Andaman Sea along the west coast, we now leave the south of the peninsula and make our way north along the east coast. First stop, the port of Mersing. Fishing on the east coast is influenced by the winter monsoon. Heavy rains affect the salt levels in the sea and the numbers of fish in it. The east coast is washed by the South China Sea. Rawa Island is made of coral a fact confirmed by the color of the sand. It's also privately owned by the Sultan of Johor. A hotel complex has been built here, which seems to be at one with the island which provided its building materials. The virtually unspoilt tropical natural environment is one of the island's great assets. But isolation also has its downside. Aziz Otman is responsible for the stewardship of the island. We have, uh, at the beginning of the, in 1972, it started, uh, the resort has been developed. But then uh, it was only a coconut plantation. So we have been working very hard to develop the island. We have no water here, which we have to buy from Mersing. Water has to come from the mainland, and electricity is provided by generators. Nature is everywhere in Malaysia. It is easily approached as long as it is treated with respect.
The tropical climate and the monsoon guarantee that Malaysia gets a regular supply of fresh water, essential for growing crops. Prawn farming relies on machines that oxygenate the seawater. Water is also crucial to the livestock, which wanders unpredictably along the roads. There is no shortage of fresh water in Malaysia. Nevertheless, it is still purified, recycled and used sparingly. Still on the east coast is the town of Kuantan, in a region heavily influenced by Islamic values. There are many mosques in this city of half a million people. Despite the heat, it would be unthinkable for these women to wear a bathing costume on the beach. Hair, arms and legs must always be covered up. Here, Islamic law is enforced everywhere. Alcohol is nowhere to be found, including in the hotels. All along the road are dozens of stalls reliant on passing trade. These are the best places to try local specialities that you will not find anywhere else. Tropical fruits are laid out before the local housewives. Longans, rambutans and mangoes. On these stalls and grills, the produce is guaranteed to be fresh. Everything is prepared in front of the customer. Kerupek liqueur is a kind of sausage rolled up in a fish or shrimp dough. For limang, bamboo stems are used to cook sticky rice mixed with coconut milk. Oil and gas have been among the country's resources since the 1970s. The principal reserves are offshore, notably here on the east coast. At first sight, fossil fuel production doesn't seem to have had a detrimental effect on the lives of the locals. The people in Terengganu have benefited greatly from this manna from the ground. The sumptuous crystal mosque was built clad entirely in glass. The building is the embodiment of the role played by religion here, as the faithful believe that Islam is the light of the world. The light reveals the glass worker's craftsmanship. He plays with fire to capture the glass's movement and freeze it in time. Natural fibers are regularly used in local crafts. Some crafts are particularly complex. One Moho Hafiz owns a batik workshop. They will boil the wax until it, it, it will melt and it will become a liquid. So there is a pan that, that we are specifically used for chanting and call chanting and then we, they will dip the pan in the wax and they will draw on the batik, on the cloth. Batik motifs are inspired by vegetation. The colours are far more resilient than those on normal textiles. In fact, the cloth is completely immersed in the dye. Tropical vegetation dominates the Malaysian landscape. Paddy fields abound, but the country does not produce enough rice to be self-sufficient. To reduce the need for importing rice, the yield needs to be increased through mechanization. 
but the problem is exacerbated by population growth. In the far northeast of the peninsula, Kota Baru is close to the border with Thailand. In this predominantly Muslim region, the roles of men and women are clearly identified. In the town's main market, the women have pride of place among the fruit and vegetables. Most of the stalls are run by women. This is a very different setup to what one would find in Arab markets, exclusively run by men. Men are among the clientele, notably seeking to buy turtles' eggs. Malaysia shares a 500-kilometer-long border with Thailand, a border obviously convenient for cultural exchange. This Buddhist temple offers Thai language courses. Cultural diversity is a mainstay of Malaysian society. This temple's architecture is Thai, but the Buddha worshipped here belongs to everyone. Buddha can adopt a variety of different postures. He can be depicted standing or often sitting in the lotus position. He might even be lying down. Dance is Thailand's ambassador in Malaysia. Surprisingly, although the architecture of this temple is Chinese, the minaret indicates that this is, in fact, a mosque. This is the Peking Mosque. Enter inside and enter into the Muslim world. Here in Malaysia, religious tolerance is not just hollow words. These characters fashioned out of leather are marionettes from the famous Shadow Puppet Theatre, whose traditional origins are very ancient. Mud Dain Man. They, they developed the puppet by the combination of puppet from the Siamese uh, Shadow Play or Thailand Shadow Play. Uh, with uh, puppet from Java. The combination of these two categories of puppet become our Kelantan uh, puppets. The country is divided into two by a mountain range which must be crossed to get from the eastern to the western side of the peninsula. Close to Thailand, it is not unusual to run into an elephant or two. This is the vast area of rainforest where you will find living fossils tree ferns. Lake Temengor is an artificial lake where treetops still emerge from the surface of the water. Along the road, a wedding celebration. Young Muslim newlyweds follow a very specific set of rituals. In the villages, custom dictates that everyone be invited to the ceremony. Tea is served with the meal. The newlyweds wear traditional costumes, such as the groom's headdress, the tanjak. Among the many wedding presents are eggs, symbolizing fertility. In the middle of the Andaman Sea, the Langkawi archipelago consists of over a hundred islands and has a unique geological heritage. It is one of UNESCO's geoparks. The Kilim River, with its impenetrable mangrove swamp, is part of a rich ecosystem, 
dominated by dozens of sea eagles. In fact, Langkawi means red-brown eagle. Herun Musa. The species of eagle we can find in the mangrove, namely the Brahmini kite and the white-bellied sea eagle. The Brahmini kite is a symbolic of the Langkawi island, or the Langkawi name. Up to 16 to 20 different species of eagle. The river snakes through limestone rock formations. At the edge of the mangrove forest, the trees create a barrier that's impenetrable to all but the crab-eating macaque, searching for its favorite meal. From out of nowhere, suddenly appears a langur, a black monkey with white-rimmed eyes. The folds in the rock tell the geological story of a site over 500 million years old. The main challenge for a geopark is to make nature accessible to the public while still protecting it. From the high ground, you can see into Thailand. The natural makeup of the rock explains the formations, the effects of erosion, the concentration and distribution of the vegetation. Now we head south on the Andaman Sea towards Penang. A bridge 13 kilometers long links the island to the mainland. The island's commercial tradition dates back to the 15th century when the Chinese were already trading through the port. Penang's growth has been strong a fact attested to by the city's profile. The economy is driven by the electronics industry and its associated IT spin-offs. There is a huge discrepancy between the modern skyline and the ancient houses built on stilts. It was 19th century Chinese migrants who built the Chu Jetty wooden houses. They worked at the port and needed to live close by. And little by little, their families joined them. Hello. The fort, built by the British at the end of the 18th century, was designed to protect the flourishing city and its trade in pepper and spices. The Chinese form the majority in Penang, which is also the country's most densely populated state. Kek Lok Si is Malaysia's largest Buddhist temple complex, comprising several temples, such as the Snake Temple. Shortly after it was built, snakes made it their home. Instead of chasing them away, the monks fed them. The reptiles seem harmless. But you can't be too careful, as the waggler's rattlesnake can inflict a very painful bite. The primary vocation of the Hangxiang Temple is instructing the faithful in the principles of Buddhist education. Georgetown is the state capital. The city was founded by the East India Trading Company. 
the historic town center has been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Chinese community celebrates the nine emperor gods. The celebration lasts nine days. Forty percent of Malaysian territory is on the peninsula. The rest is on the great island of Borneo. The Malay part of Borneo consists of Sarawak and Sabah states. Kota Kinabalu is the capital of Sabah, 1,600 kilometers from Kuala Lumpur. It's rare to find relics of colonial Britain. They were destroyed by Allied bombardment. During the Second World War, Malaysia was occupied by the Japanese. Since then, the city has developed by spreading out. The city mosque is situated on an artificial lake. Proximity to water is a characteristic of the traditional habitat. Stilts allow air to circulate beneath the house and also limit the damage caused by flooding. This is a perfect way to adapt to the climate. Ventilation is essential because of the extreme heat and humidity. Sabah is known as the land beneath the wind because it is in the path of Pacific Ocean cyclones. Tunku Abdul Rahman National Park offers a wonderful opportunity to relax. This marine park consists of five highly protected islands. They were originally part of Borneo before the rising waters at the end of the Ice Age separated them from the main island. Further away from the coast, the hills are more pronounced and vegetation flourishes. There are more plant species here than in Europe and North America combined. The region is dominated by Mount Kinabalu, the country's highest peak. In Nabalu's bustling market, the tobacco merchant shares space and customers with the dried fish seller. Small traders try to attract attention with free samples. The high altitude has a considerable effect on the temperature in the hills of Sabah. Because of the terrain, farmers have to content themselves with small holdings. The hillsides have to be deforested and then the back-breaking task of creating farmable parcels of land can begin. These conditions mean that the soil is mainly used to grow food crops, like cabbage. Some crops need constant watering. Others can make do with rain from any passing clouds. The equator bisects the island of Borneo not far from here. The heat and humidity are favorable factors in Kenabolu Park's natural fecundity. The park has remarkable biodiversity. One half of all flowering plant families grow here. And the park also has several hot water springs. But Kinabalu is not a botanical garden. Virtually all the park is covered by wild flora and fauna. Among its most spectacular specimens is the world's biggest flower, the Rafflesia. In the tropical forest, most of the plants seek sunlight. In the undergrowth are species different from those above that enjoy the sun. 
a system of walkways enables visitors to explore the forest canopy. Yeah, the canopy walkway from the starting until to the ending is uh, 175 meters. So from the ground to the bridge is about 43 meters. Several plant species are endemic here. They grow in a park which spans six different plant zones. Along the Klias River, the forest is exceptionally rich. Along its banks, you may spot the remarkable proboscis monkey. This big-nosed monkey is only to be found on Borneo. But the island has many species. Proboscis monkey, sometimes if we are lucky, we can see the long tail macaque. And sometimes the silver leaf monkey, we can see around here. But usually the proboscis monkey, we can see here. Borneo has a remarkable biodiversity. In the last 20 years, 600 previously unknown species have been discovered here. Just a single tree can harbor a thousand varieties of insect. The island is teeming with remarkable life forms. In the cultural village of Mari Mari, behind the giant bamboo, we can meet the formerly fearsome headhunters, now quite friendly to outsiders, the Murut. <coughs> Around 30 ethnic groups live on Sabah. The Murut are one of these and share their way of life with visitors, for example, demonstrating how to make rice wine. Using traditional methods, they make roti jala, a delicate coconut milk pancake. The wood is rubbed vigorously until it catches fire. This technique is a lot older than just striking a match. The murut live in harmony with their environment and make the best of all its resources. This is um, the demonstration of uh, making uh, the vest, yeah, tree bark vest. It's made of the timbagan tree bark, right? Now how do they do this? First, they'll just go to the jungle, get the, uh, the tree. When they get the tree, they'll just peel off the tree bark. And next, after, they'll soak it in water for a few days. And next, after, they will take it out from the water and they will start pounding it. This traditional house rests on stilts. Flexible yet strong, bamboo is the main building material in a dwelling where everything has been thought of. Basically, it has two bedrooms for the parents and for the single girls, right? Now, this is the ladder for the single girls to go up. And the special thing about this one is when the single girls uh, go to sleep, the parents will take this away. Order and discipline go hand in hand with comfort. The boys, they will normally sleep here to protect the house, this part of the house. This house is very, they are very, very clever. They have air conditioning as well, right? And when they feel hot, yeah, they will just lift up the roof yeah, and it will get strong wood to support it. Exercise and leisure are provided by a lansaran, a kind of trampoline which enables the player to jump to reach a target hung from the ceiling. At the crossroads of ancient culture and maritime trading routes, Malaysia is one of Asia's genuine reserves a cultural reserve, 
a heritage reserve, a reserve for nature. <laughs>